and blessed be the Holy Trinity and undivided unity. We will give glory to him because he hath shown his mercy to us. Trinity and undivided unity, we said in the introit of today's Mass. And in the offertory, we will be even more specific and say, Blessed be God the Father and the only begotten Son of God and also the Holy Spirit. And we will repeat, because he hath shown his mercy to us. Well, God's mercy, we know, is manifested principally in the Incarnation. God the Son becoming man and dying for our sins, saving us from the fires of hell. Yet the texts for today's Mass specifically thank each, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why we do this may be obvious. Nevertheless, on Trinity Sunday, for the glory of God and for our edification, let's look at it just a little bit. We're presented today with the mystery of the Trinity, and today it seems is the perfect day for it, since we have just celebrated the coming of the Holy Ghost last week at Pentecost. St. Rupert tells us the same. The place today is well chosen, for immediately after the descent of the Holy Spirit began the preaching and belief and through baptism, faith and confession in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But what does that mean, to have belief, faith, and confession in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? It's not an academic question, for it is one of the central mysteries of our faith, and it does tie to the others. A friend once told me that there were three things he knew he could always cling to if ever tempted to doubt that what we believe is really from God. The Eucharist the hypostatic union, and the Trinity. Why these three? Because each one of these mysteries of our faith is so far beyond the ability of man to comprehend, it simply has to be true. In other words, no man could ever make up such a thing. These three, the Trinity, the Eucharist, and the hypostatic union, they're mysteries absolutely That is, they will never be understood, even when we are in heaven. Only God is capable of comprehending these mysteries properly. If what we believe is reasonable, and it is, reasonable simply means there is nothing in this teaching that is contrary to reason. There is nothing in these beliefs that is against right reason. There's plenty that's beyond reason, but there's nothing that is unreasonable. And if it is reasonable, we ought to be able to explain what we mean when we profess belief, faith, and confession in the Trinity, also the Eucharist and the hypostatic union, but today, the Trinity. There is, of course, St. Patrick's famous example, using the shamrock, the three leaves, and each leaf shares in what it means to be a shamrock, and all three leaves together make the shamrock, yet there's only one shamrock. It's a wonderful teaching tool as far as it goes, but the Apostle of Ireland was not fashioning here a creed. And his analogy, of course, limps in that each leaf does not have the fullness of what it means to be a shamrock. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Tradition, however, has handed down to us a creed which can be used as an elaboration of St. Patrick's lesson. This is called the Athanasian Creed named, obviously, for St. Athanasius. And you've heard parts of this before. Here is a brief, very brief, paraphrase. We worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity. We distinguish among the persons, but we do not divide the substance. The three have one divinity, equal glory, and co-eternal majesty. There are not three beings, but one eternal being. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and there are not three gods, but one God. Each of the persons individually is God. The Son is generated by the Father alone. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. There is one Father, one Son, one Holy Spirit. In this Trinity, there is nothing greater, nothing lesser than anything else. Well, the Athanasian Creed dates back to the 5th century, 
And since that time, much has been discussed and taught about the Trinity, but in all the centuries since, there has not been a more clear or complete explanation of the Trinity. It's all there already in the Athanasian Creed for anyone to hear and to assent to, that is, for anyone to believe in. And we must believe it if we will call ourselves Catholic. Look at what it says. One God in the Trinity and Trinity in unity. We are monotheists. We believe in one God. All our recent first communicants had to study that. One God. But we know that the one God is a Trinity. That is, three in one. Three what? Well, the Creed has an answer for that. We distinguish among the persons but we do not divide the substance. It is the three persons that we acknowledge in the Trinity, but we remain monotheists because the substance is the substance of God. And there is only one God. There cannot be more than one supreme being. It's a contradiction in terms. And so the substance, the Godness, is undivided even though there are three persons. And not only do we affirm that there are three in God, three in one God, and that that these three are persons, but in fact it is from this discussion of the Trinity that philosophy gets its idea of what a person is. The classical definition of person simply says a person is an individual substance of a rational nature. We can take a closer look at that. It is kind of packed. But very simply, remember what we said a person is. A person answers the question, who? Nature answers the question, what? What am I? I'm a man. Who am I? I'm father. In the case of the Trinity, we can ask, what is it? And we have to say that it is God. That says something about what it is. But if we ask who it is, we have to say he is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All three. And thus we come to the mystery. Our classical definition cannot distinguish separate persons without dividing the substance. That is to say, each person is a separate individual occurrence of a particular substance or nature. Let's use man as an example. The substance of man is a composite of body and a rational soul. So Joe is a man, and Mike is a man, and Earl is a man. But Joe is not Earl, and Earl is not Mike, and so on. Each is an individual distinct from the others, but united by a common nature we call man. Now, where God is concerned, there is only one substance in any person of the Trinity, and that substance is God. Each of the three persons has the same substance, whole and entire. Each individually is God, but there can be only one God. For God, by definition, is the supreme being, the one cause of all other things in the universe. There cannot be two supreme beings. It's a contradiction. There may be multiple men, and we don't wonder at this, since the idea of what it, me- what it means to be a man, that is, the human, that is the nature of man, allows for many individual men. But with God, supreme means supreme. Above all others, no equals. How can he be three? What is going on is that our classical definition does apply to God, but in a whole other way, in a far superior way. If we say that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are merely united in a common nature, we might come, we might think that we've solved the mystery, except that we're talking about God, and it is his nature to be unique, singular, one of a kind. The Athanasian Creed addresses this. There are not three gods, but one God. Each of the persons, individually, is God. St. Patrick would be the first to agree that all analogies limp. 
Each leaf is part of a shamrock, and each share is in the nature of a shamrock, but each leaf is not the shamrock. So too with our man Earl. Earl shares in the nature of man. So we say Earl is a man. But Earl is not man. That is, Earl is not what it means, it is not all of humanity. But how different with God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but there are not three gods, but one God. Each of the persons, individually, is God. We cannot say that the Father is a God, or the Son is a God, nor the Holy Ghost, but each is God, complete and fully. And for precision, the creed exhausts this next point, the processions. The Son is generated by the Father alone, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. There is one Father, one Son, one Holy Spirit. And that finally brings us to the last part, which I read earlier. In this Trinity, there is nothing greater, nothing lesser than anything else. And this must be so if the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. For God is one in number and in unity or he is not God. Each one is equal to the others. Each one is everything that the others are, except that person. And finally, this question that I insisted was not academic, what does it mean, as St. Rupert says, to have belief, faith, and confession in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is answered by this age-old Athanasian Creed. But how is it any less academic than it was a few minutes ago? Well, if we move out of Trinitarian theology for just a little bit, and we look for a moment at those other pillars of my friend's faith, hypostatic union and the Eucharist, gaining whatever comprehension we can about the Trinity should be a powerful aid to our devotion. For we know that in the Incarnation, the Son of God became man. But the Son of God is God and remained God when he took on human nature and remains God now forever in heaven, still united to our human nature. Humanity is joined to the Trinity. And this is the same person that is consumed in the Eucharist, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Full humanity and full divinity. God, the supreme being, is received. Yes, the Son specifically, but the Son is God. The fullness of God. All that God is. This is even emphasized by the church herself in the Mass. For example, the priest When he prays the Our Father, the rubrics instruct him specifically to be looking at the consecrated host there on the altar. When the priest has consecrated the host, he speaks, he he spoke in the person of Christ. He said, This is my body. That is, this is Christ's body. Yet when he prays the Our Father, he addresses that prayer to the same consecrated host. The church is affirming this unity between the Father and the Son and implicitly also the Holy Spirit. The Lord is our King. He will save us, says Isaiah. God hath visited his people. The Word became flesh. That is, God became man. See, the Greeks had their legends about gods and the children of gods walking the earth. But just as their gods were not divine, their legends were only legends. We who profess belief in the one true and triune God know that he is God and that his son, who is not a God, but is God himself, walked the earth, justly thinking 
It is not robbery to be himself equal to God. How awesome it is to contemplate the incarnate word of God, for this is God himself, born in a stable, nursing at Mary's breast, playing, working, sweating, sleeping at Nazareth, and God hanging on a tree. Blessed be God the Father, and the only begotten Son of God, and also the Holy Spirit, because he hath shown mercy to us. The question of what belief in the Trinity means is not academic, because God has visited his people. And God, by the incarnation, life, death, and and resurrection of the second person of the Trinity, has forever tied his infinite and eternal life, triune as he is, to ours, so that we might be one with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.